and commerce smile upon my dear my native isle not egypt with her flowing nile should equal thee sweet erin fine silver lakes and purling springs and verdant groves where music rings and health with healing in her wings do bless the land of erin my name is Cahill Lynch and uh, we're here in the home of John Molden here this afternoon. Um, it's Saturday the 22nd of May 2021 and uh, it's great to be here to record John on behalf of the Nya in County Cavan. John, how are you? I'm grand. It's good to see you As again. well as can be expected under present circumstances. You're looking well anyway. <laughs> Good. I'm glad Just to know it. Trying to you, that's something you tell old people when they're on their last <laughs> legs, but still. Well, I was just trying to think there when we arrived here in, in Carn Dunna here in the in his shown uh, peninsula here in County Donegal. The la well, I was trying to think when I last saw you in person with all this COVID and pandemic going on and all the rest, you know, it's 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 been a while, I think. Well, it would be a couple of years it anyway. Must be. Yeah, yeah. It must either. yeah, it must be. Um, how have you been or what have you been up to in the last while? Or... Well, being enforcedly stuck in the house mm -hmm. for a year and a half, near enough now, mm -hmm. uh, I've been sort of consolidating. This that is now being filmed is not really my house. <laughs> it's the house under my house. I live in a townhouse up above this flat, mm -hmm. but this flat holds my collection of many years mm -hmm. and I've been taking the opportunity of rearranging it, finding out again what's in it, checking that everything's in its place, beginning to list it and also principally I've been working on a computer uh, making a website to put down the stuff which I've written mm -hmm the articles, the presentations I've mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. over the last near enough, I suppose, 50, <coughs> nearly, nearly 60 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have also begun to look at the recordings I made from about, I suppose, 1964 or so. Uh, and transfer them to a digital form. So you've certainly been... Uh very busy. I've been I've been busy <laughs> apart from that, and I also have been running a couple of Facebook groups. Indeed. Irish indeed. song, Irish song research. Yes, indeed. And another one about the sort of singing session that we're forced to have now. Yes. Zoomed singing sessions, mm -hmm. and initially the group was called cancelled singing sessions, and then that began to be not quite what we were doing so I recast it as re-zoomed mm -hmm. singing sessions right. with a pun on <clears throat> re meaning about and then resumed as, as the other word but I'm fond of puns and, mm -hmm. and silly things like that. Well John I, I've known you now I was just thinking there in the road down and this last while. You were about 16. I met you first at the Geordie Hanna singing weekend um, in Derry Tresk in County Tyrone and obviously I'd heard of you and knew of you before that. But we've been at many festivals and uh, we've met on many occasions over the years. But I suppose the first thing I would like to ask you, John, is um, you've described what you've been doing in the last while. Just to take you back, where did this all begin for John Molden? How did this all happen? And what sort of childhood experiences of Irish traditional song, folk song, how did it all begin? How did this happen? Well, it was an unpromising beginning. Right. Because I was born in Belfast of English parents who migrated here in 1929 for my father to take up a job in Belfast. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1941 and my first recollection of being <coughs> interested in songs is when my sister came home from school, bringing with her a songbook in about quarto size, uh, 
bit less than A4. Mm -hmm. And she was singing out of it, John Cook's Grey Mare. <laughs> and I was simply fascinated to hear this song about, as I say, any sort of circumstance at all. Mm -hmm. And that songbook is still among my collection. I, I have that songbook, mm -hmm. as I have a lot of songbooks from the time when I was a child. I experienced singing for skipping rhymes and things of that kind mm -hmm. in the street, but also uh, other songs, all, all sorts of songs mm -hmm. on the street. I joined Cubs and we sang songs there. Mm -hmm. There was, of course, Sunday school where we sang hymns. There was school where we sang official songs, but some of them were described then as folk songs, mm -hmm. although I didn't remark them at the time. They, they didn't seem to me to be particularly important. You were born in Belfast. Um, can you remember, I suppose, I mean, a couple of things. Can you remember any sort of traditional folk singers or as we call them source singers from that time that you would have saw not when, or not heard? When I was Not when I was a child. No. The only thing that I remember is that Desi Braden, mm -hmm. who was my own age, the age of about 12 or 13, came and sang us a song mm -hmm. that started A Working Man Came Home Last Night. And we thought it was a dirty song because the girl was obviously pregnant yes. and hung herself. But it's a version of a well-known traditional song, which is known as Died for Love. And it is, is quite, uh, quite common. Mm -hmm. But that sort of thing just came into... It was the sort of thing that would have circulated yes, yes. at the time. Although, obviously, there were also just the usual songs that children sing mm -hmm. uh, and was there any particular radio stroke television programs that, well, I, that I remember have, uh, I remember you would have listened to country heard. magazine okay uh, on a Sunday morning when there was a song sung by a traditional singer mm -hmm. at the end of it yes and then there was also a program which consisted entirely of songs mm -hmm called As I Roved Out. Yes. And that was introduced by Sarah Makem mm -hmm. singing the first part of As I Roved Out mm -hmm. Upon a May Morning. Mm -hmm. And she would have sung that, but they weren't courageous enough. Was that the Sean and Boyle programme? Yes. It? Oh, yes. To right, allow okay. the traditional singer to have the whole song. Mm -hmm. It was then taken over by trained singers mm -hmm. with half uh, or a quartet or, mm -hmm. or a piano accompaniment yes. Yes. so that as I say but I heard songs on the radio mm -hmm. and I heard songs on the radio right throughout my childhood mm -hmm. until again I learned songs in scouts later on I, I went to youth hostels I went to mountaineering clubs and we all had songs but nobody at that stage had heard of or was particularly <coughs> conscious of a thing called folk songs mm. or traditional songs. As far as we were concerned, they were just the songs we sang yes. in the circumstances. They were just songs, really. Yeah, there was no sort of songs. correct but, title on them. As but among them uh, is a, a fairly well-known sort of canal barge song called The Cruise of the Calabar. Uh, I learned that when I was about 15. Mm -hmm. And since then, I, I, I've learned that there's a version of it for virtually every river or canal in Ireland. There's one for the for Straban, mm -hmm. there's one for Dublin, and, and probably probably one for Cork and anywhere else where there's a shallowish river that people find difficulty in navigating. And it's a spoof that says that imagines that a barge mm -hmm. is a real ship with real dangers mm -hmm. running up on a lump of coal and so on. So I suppose that's sort of the beginning of your life in, in that. Um, I know you've often told me and um, at various conversations with you over the years that your song research or academic research or call it what you like 
sort of started in sort of a haphazard way. Um, but then, as we all know now, <laughs> with your publications and lectures and sleeve notes for albums, it became, for want of a better description, a more disciplined art form. Um, when did the res- when did when did the the research become more serious or well, when, when did when did that happen for you you know when did that start in a way it almost happened towards the end of my time at school okay uh, we were divided into houses for the sake of competition some of the, some of the houses but there were six of them in all yes and uh, we had a sort of house <clears throat> party at the end of the last term of my my school career in fact Mm -hmm. and I'd been singing and I had the previous year sung a couple of songs during the corresponding house party with a friend but then I decided in the last one to to, to make a sort of sketch out of it and present myself as an Irish lecturer talking about love songs and all kinds of love songs. And I remember singing various of the songs like Let Mr. Maguire Sit Down. And also, uh, it was in the month of May at the Fair of Listeners Gay, when the lilies and the nettles were in bloom, <laughs> a young maiden passed me by and she gave me a, the glad eye by the pale silvery light of the moon. <laughs> and she proceeds after the, the, the marriage to dismantle herself. And uh, of, to, 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 the, to the consternation of, of the man whom she's married. Mm-hmm. It was all sort of, it was all, it was sort of stage Irish stuff. That yeah. was what I knew at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I had at the same time heard a lot of songs, mm-hmm. uh, orange songs, Republican songs, uh, songs such as those uh, in Herbert Hughes's books and mm-hmm. so on, through youth hostels mm-hmm. and then when I went to Queen's, which I did for a couple of years at that stage, the Mountaineering Club mm-hmm. tended to sing songs which were more nearly traditional songs. Uh, and, and at the stage, you know, when you say traditional songs or as we sometimes call them folk songs, was the term traditional songs or folk songs in existence or were they just simply songs? Mostly people just sang songs. It, yeah. it, 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 there was there was there was. I had a conscience, a consciousness by that stage that certain songs were called folk songs. Okay. And I learned them partly at any rate because they seemed to me to be the most real of the songs. They dealt with real circumstances. They dealt with real occurrences. They talked about real people behaving in real, ordinary, everyday ways. They weren't in any way... Uh, arty mm-hmm. or Three artistic mm-hmm. that their their art if you like mm-hmm. was in their representation mm-hmm. of what was common and understood mm-hmm. and what that everyone could relate with so they were off the people really yes yeah. mm-hmm. but what what happened when i we went down to the morns for for most of our mountaineering from in the mountaineering club and developed the habit of going to a couple of bars near and along, one of them the halfway house, mm-hmm. and the other one was the harbour bar on and along harbour. And we went there. Now, nearly everybody in and along who lives in and along is a Protestant, mm-hmm. and these fishermen were nearly all Protestants and relatively religious, so that there was a tendency for them in the pub to sing hymns. But they also sang other songs. And to my shame, I cannot remember mm-hmm. what they did sing. Yeah. The one thing that stuck with me was that when these people, whom I would have regarded as folk singers mm. in, in, in my, my own mind, when they sang or asked one another to sing, sing us a song. Mm. And when they asked me to sing, they asked me to sing, sing us a folk song, Moldy. <laughs> now, that was yes. because they called yes. me, as my friends did, Moldy, short for Moldy. Yes, indeed. And obviously mm-hmm. just 
hardly anybody does. Hardly anybody has the courage to do that. Well, now. you said it. <laughs> but but the thing is that this distinction. Mm -hmm. They were the folk singers. I was the interloper. I was the blow in. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. And they were making a difference. And it's it's it has since occurred to me that that the word folk song or folk singer puts a distance, a social distance, a cultural difference, even perhaps an educational difference between the person who is observing and the person who's singing. So if I go along to somebody and say, do you know any folk songs? Mm -hmm. He'll sing me Blowing in the Wind mm -hmm. or he'll sing me The Dubliners or something. The Dubliners yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah. Whereas what I want what I'm looking for mm. and what he then realizes I'm mm. looking for are just songs, old songs perhaps, but mm -hmm. the, the w I do not like the uh, descriptions that are used in most of the books. I don't like the word folk. I don't like the word traditional. I don't like the word Irish even because I think that Irish and English, for that matter, are too often used politically. Mm -hmm. But traditional implies a standard. Mm -hmm. The songs that people sang, people like Elizabeth Cronin, mm -hmm. people like Bridget Tunney, people like Paddy Tunney, people like Robert Cinnamon, mm -hmm. people like Sammy Pagan, people like Eddie Butcher, they sang the songs that they heard. Mm -hmm. And they sang anything that they heard. One of the songs that Eddie Butcher sang uh, to my son in America was given him on a sheet by Hugh Shields. Eddie put an air to it, not knowing that the song had been written by the director of the National Library of Ireland, Alf McLaughlin, wow. who then became the librarian of NUI Galway. Wow. But this this song was written in really quite traditional form and was made and has now been, in fact, was collected from Eddie mm -hmm. and put on a recording as if it was a traditional song. So that started me on another train of thought. What are these songs? These are these are really just songs whose origin we have forgotten. Yes that we can't trace the origin. Now, if that's so, then that the term folk song or the term traditional song, in a way, has little or no meaning. Mm -hmm. We know what we mean, mm -hmm. but it's something different from the object. Mm -hmm. It comes down for me to being singing with sincerity. I suppose, you know, when we look at research and, you know, just back to that point, when, when the name John Molden is mentioned in the circles that we mix in, shall we say, I suppose the, f the, the, the publication that springs to mind is, of course, the Sam Henry collection, which the songs of the people. Um, I know you've done so much, so, so much work, but I know that one would be the one that people would, I suppose, associate your authority on Sam. And I know you had a connection and relationship with you know his family tell me a bit about your relationship and your work on the sam henry and uh, that type of thing john well it started again when i was a student mm -hmm. at queens and the reason why i only spent two years at queens at that time was because i was doing anything else but studying <laughs> i was mountaineering but i was <laughs> but i was also <laughs> I was also going down to the Belfast Music Library, right. which, is, which was on the upper floor okay. of the Central Library in Royal Avenue. Mm -hmm. And this was presided over by a genial, tall, rather austere looking man whom I only knew as Mr. Kelly. And after I'd been through virtually all of the books on the shelves, he, he produced a couple of things for me. Presumably, I don't know whether it was because I was a regular and therefore a favoured customer or whether he did this eventually for everybody who showed any real interest. Mm -hmm. 
but Mr. Kelly said, oh, well, we have the Sam Henry collection. Mm -hmm. And he brought out these two volumes wow, wow. that looked to me like cuttings from a newspaper or cuttings from newspapers. Mm -hmm. And to my shame, I remember not knowing enough about the songs that people sang yes. to realise just what I was looking at. Yeah. He produced another thing for me at the time, a book entitled Broadside Ballads yes. that had originally been in, in the uh, public record office and had been passed over to the music library as being more appropriate. <coughs> and in a sense, those two things were, the, in, a, in a way, were the, the big things that I've been lucky enough to encounter mm -hmm. and to be privileged to be allowed to get in control of. Yeah. Now, the Sam Henry took me a lot longer to, to think about. It was the early 1960s yeah. when I first encountered it. Yeah. And it was not until 1979 that I eventually published anything from yes. it. Mm -hmm. But there was a journey in between that, mm -hmm. which was quite slow to begin. Right. And it really only started after the start of the Belfast and Northern Irish Troubles mm -hmm. in 1969, <coughs> mm -hmm. when I was living on the east, fairly far out of Belfast, and travel was restricted. Right. I couldn't go into the town as I had been previously to singing sessions, to folk clubs, to Pat's Bar, where the music went on mm -hmm. and there was a good deal of singing. Instead, I was stuck at home. So I was forced into a kind of a library-based research. Yeah, yeah. And I began to look harder. And by that time, I had actually learned a bit more about what was traditional mm -hmm. and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I went back to the uh, music library in Royal Avenue. Yes. And at that stage, I had every page of the Sam Henry collection as they had it copied. I was only allowed to do it 10% at a time because if you understand the copyright laws didn't allow me to copy the whole yeah. thing. I had to get it one day and then come back another day and get mm -hmm. another 10% of it as if I'd had none Tedious of it before. Task, yeah. But okay. eventually yeah. uh, I got the whole of it and I started looking at it and I started looking then l later going down the odd time down to Dublin, looking at what the National Library had and comparing. Mm -hmm. But in 1972, I went to teach in a, the preparatory school for Campbell College, Cabin Hill School, which was quite close to where I was living. In fact, it was the school I had gone to myself as a, as a, as a 10 to 13 year old. You went to Campbell College? I went to Cabin Hill oh, and sorry. then to Campbell right. College, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and while I was there and and while I was thrown on library work, yes. I began looking harder at the, at the Sam Henry and began to think, you know, there's a lot of this that I haven't seen in books, haven't seen in other books. So I, I developed the idea of producing, a, getting a hundred of these songs that hadn't otherwise being published in Ireland right. and putting them in a single book. Now that was my initial idea, mm. but there was a kind of a snag. The, the, the collection was controlled by Sam Henry's daughter, whom some people had called on and tried to talk to and who was reported to be a rather formidable lady. In fact, she hunted nearly everybody who ever went near her. Right. She lived in Kilray. Yes, indeed. But I developed the idea of doing this. Yeah. And then another library day, I was in the Linen Hall Library, Another. asking them about songs and so on. And they said, oh, by the way, we've got the Sam Henry collection. And they produced for me a number of orange scrapbooks, which had been accumulated by a Belfast solicitor called A.A. A. Campbell. 
but there was a mystery in the Sam Henry collection as it had been in the Belfast Library in that there was a big gap. There was a gap in the numbering from, four, from roughly 247 to about 460. There was this gap that appeared Sam Henry either the pieces had been lost or there was there was some other reason and I asked well are there missing bits there in the linen hall mm -hmm. and I did and I found them but they hadn't been collected right. by Sam Henry mm -hmm. they had the initials JM WD WJT mm -hmm. and so on indicating other people had been in control of the collection and its appearance weekly in a newspaper. What newspaper was that, John? It was the Northern Constitution of right. Coleraine. Coleraine, okay. Sam Henry at that time lived in Coleraine. But the, the collection intrigued me and I kept on sort of working on it loosely until I got to talking to a colleague, Philip Hammond, now a very well-known composer mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. Yes. Uh, among his works are the Requiem for the Titanic, yeah, which was published and performed in, 19, in 2012. But Philip was at that time doing work in connection with the biography of Hamilton Harty, the famous conductor and composer from Hillsborough. And he said that he'd been working with this man called James Moore, who had known Sam Henry and had actually worked on the Songs of the People collection. So it connected that J.M. was James Moore. Wow. So I was introduced to James Moore. And in chatting to Jim, I discovered that Jim had his own traditional music collection which he had made in and around Bush Mills and Port Ballantrae, mm -hmm. but previously <clears throat> in Remelton, where his family had lived, before they had been intimidated as Protestants out of that area of Donegal mm -hmm. and gone to live in Bush Mills in, about in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. So Jim had this collection made between Donegal and North Antrim. Right. But he also knew Sam Henry and he knew Sam Henry's daughter and he promised to introduce me, to arrange me an introduction. Yes. And about a week later, a young fellow came up to me in school, David Craig, whom I knew and whose mother I knew. And it turned out that this David Craig was a grandson of Sam Henry's and his mother was the formidable Mrs Craig whom everybody had had difficulty with, <laughs> and I found myself with an instant yeah. Yeah. connection, cultural yeah. and educational yeah. equivalence. She knew me already My God, eh? as, a, as a fairly affable school teacher at the time. <laughs> this was a boarding school, right. by the way, and her son was a boarder. Uh, but the relationship developed, and when... I moved in 1977 to Port Rush. Mm -hmm. They lived in Kilray, mm -hmm. and I went and I spent days with Olive in the house because she had preserved the whole of Sam Henry's, or pretty well the whole of Sam Henry's library and archive, which is now courtesy of her family, of her four sons, lodged in the archive of the Causeway Museum, which is the, the Causeway College <coughs> Museum mm -hmm. in, well, it's actually housed in Balamoney, mm -hmm. but that is now largely accessible online. A lot of the documents, a lot of the photographs have been digitized and are available online mm -hmm. through, uh, I, I can't remember the website's name, but, but it, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll turn up anyway, but but, but I was able then to look at all the rest of the stuff that Sam Henry had left behind at his death in 1952. And I was the, the first, if you like, 
to use that because that was how I compiled mm -hmm. elements yes. of my hundred yes. selection of a hundred of Sam Henry's songs and managed to put a bit more flesh on the bones by having some idea who the people were, mm -hmm. what sort of people they were, yes. and also some of their interests because there were letters from them. There, there were, there, I mean, there were letters which indicated really strong and important friendships, yeah. real stuff, relationships yeah. mm -hmm. between Sam Henry and 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 the singers. Yeah. I even got to 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 talk to one of them, a woman called Harriet Brownlow, who was representative of of a family near Coleraine, nearly all of whom had given songs to Sam Henry, her father, her mother, her sister Maggie, and herself. And that was a tremendous, uh, tremendous privilege to, to, to talk in that way. And then there wasn't just Olive Craig, Sam Henry's daughter, but there was Hetty, who was a friend of hers, who had been the family's maid, mm -hmm. and therefore who knew enormous amounts about Sam Henry and the things that he did and all the things he did. Mm -hmm. Now... I mean, there, there's, there is so much that, that it's pretty yeah. well impossible to say. Yeah. A lot of it I have in photocopy here yeah. and haven't the, the merest chance of working through. Mm -hmm. But I hope that other people will take the opportunity mm -hmm. at some time. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the important thing, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, is that all of the knowledge that I have gained by pure good luck by being in the right place at the right time mm -hmm. is that I want other people to carry it on mm -hmm. carry it on singing carrying it carry on thinking about it mm -hmm. <coughs> carry on researching mm -hmm. but I don't want people to be academic I'm only an academic again by accident I'm only an academic because the academic way of working is, is one way of working. You work very carefully and you say where you got information from mm -hmm. and you say how you processed it. And just because you're expecting other people to come behind and check up on you. People who are going to take equal Co care. Contradict you. <laughs> and it's, yes, precisely. I don't mind being contradicted. <laughs> I don't mind people having a better idea than I have. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that, that's one of the things. It's not, about, it's not about the research. The research has been about understanding songs and singers and the ways people sing and the reasons for which they sing yeah. better. And... When it comes down to it, it's all about the songs. I don't want to, to talk to anybody who doesn't love songs. Mm -hmm. I don't want to argue with anybody who doesn't love songs. If they don't love songs, they'll not be listening to me talking about songs. Because what the hell? They have no way of relating to me. Mm -hmm. So it's all about songs and singing and having a good time with friends. Mm -hmm. It's not about these books are no more than a help. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes, as I've said, I don't like the words they use. Yeah. Sometimes the books are a hindrance. And just, just you know, to, to jump on the word friends here. I mean, <clears throat> one person that certainly I know and many others, uh, a very good friend of yours, Portadown-born uh, Porta Robin Morton. Just to talk about your collaboration with Robin in his wonderful books on John Maguire, Come Day, Go Day, God Send Sunday. Just tell us about Robin, your relationship with Robin Morton. Robin is an extraordinary guy. Yeah. Absolutely astounding. Uh, I met him first about 1963 or 1964. Right. Uh -huh. He'd been in London. Uh, when he left school, he started doing some kind of social work or being a, a care assistant to uh, people with learning difficulties right. and that things really of that kind. Okay. And he, 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 he slowly 
did diplomas mm -hmm. and when he was in London doing a, doing a social work diploma and he came back and he came to Queen's to, I think to do a further diploma in that sort of area mm -hmm. to become a psychiatric social worker and one of the interesting things he said about the difference between psychiatric social workers and psychiatrists was that psychiatrists wanted to work with the children and consider their families <laughs> afterwards and psychiatric social workers <laughs> thought it ought to be the other way around there you go. but that's nothing to do with traditional song it's to do with some kind of relationship and how, how how people behave themselves but robin as i say but he had been in london mm -hmm. and he got keen on just singing songs yeah. he'd met ewan mccall he'd mm -hmm. been to ewan mccall's singers club to to various places bob davenport's mm -hmm. club at islington and when he came back, he was singing songs like Join the British Army and Kosher Bailey and such like. And actually, I have a recording of that, but I won't hold it against him. There are many recordings <laughs> of me that I would prefer not to be held against me. But he came and he had an enormous energy and he had an enormous uh, intuitive understanding of things and people and for him it happened when his uncle James Symington took him to a pub near Portadown called the head of the road at Tartarachan. Yes. Now Tartarachan is a totally Protestant area and every man who attended that bar was a Protestant and he recorded hours of recordings from those guys, Davy Minish and Tom Todd and, and numbers of others, singing in a traditional style that was no different from any other singer, Catholic, Protestant, from Armagh, from Antrim, for, from Derry, from Down, mm -hmm. anywhere else. No difference stylistically and many of the same songs. And Robin started the Queen's Folk Song Club. Yes. I had already been partly responsible for starting the Belfast Folk Song Club and we began simply doing this and that, mm -hmm. organising lectures, organising workshops, organising <coughs> a wee library here yes. and there, talking, talking, talking about what was traditional, what was a folk song and so on yeah. and really getting quite tied up in all of these ideas. But... Robin, in his encounters with real traditional singing in Tartarachan, then got the idea because among our friends close at hand was Tommy Gunn, fiddle player by from Derelin, yeah. father of the now well-known Brendan ben, ben Gunn, mm -hmm. because who would call their son when he was Tommy Gunn, who would call his son Bren Gunn? <laughs> uh, but uh, Tommy knew all the Fermanagh singers. Yes. He knew the McConnells. And he brought Cahill up. And we heard songs from Cahill. Yeah. Cahill then introduced Robin to singers that his father had collected from. Mm -hmm. And so on. In the... Derry Lynn area. Right. Or rather the... the uh, Fermanagh. What, 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 what is it? Florence Court. Benanalek. Benanalek is, is where the, the, uh, the McConnells came from. That's right. And we went down there and, and we heard song singers and we heard musicians and so on. But Robin then started cultivating a certain number of our mass singers and also singers that he was introduced to, not only by Cattle and Tommy, but also by another Belfast resident, James McMahon, uh, owner of a wonderful ivory flute. That's right. And his brother Paddy was a singer, and Paddy introduced Robin to John Maguire. Wow. My and, favourite one of my And John, John Maguire, yeah. roughly in the... Uh, Ross Lay area yes. introduced him to other 
singers, yeah. the Malarkeys, Robbie, Malarkey. Robbie Doonan, mm -hmm. and various others across the way. Right. And Robin gathered together hours of recordings. I mean, <coughs> heaven knows how much. Mm -hmm. But it eventually, in 1969, uh, saw the publication of folk songs sung in Ulster yeah. and two accompanying LPs that contain recordings of traditional singers. Mm -hmm. The traditional singers from the book. Never knew there was recordings of that. No, there are, there are two such. Oh, are they right? Two, two such LPs, all published by Mercier in, right. in Cork. I have the book, but I, I never knew there was yeah. recordings. No, there are, there are two two sets of recordings. Right. Interesting. I'll, I'll I'll send you a copy of them sometime when I get round to it. <laughs> a busy <laughs> so, man, John. <laughs> yes. But Robin then had the idea <coughs> of that John Maguire had lived such an interesting life and his life was bound up in songs. He'd been in Scotland. He had been in Scotland when the Blantyre explosion had occurred in, in the 1870s. Right and had had the song of the Blantyre Explosion differently from the way the Scottish singers had it. Right. And Robin got the idea of talking to John and eventually presenting his songs in a kind of context, which resulted in, again, the book Come Day, Go Day, yes. God Send Sunday, and the accompanying CD of the same name that was produced by the leader company of of London. And it's sort of the life and times of John Maguire, it's, it's isn't it? It's the really? life and times and his it, it, it's more it's more about his his Fermanagh life. Yeah, more, sort of more than, more life, than anything it? else. Yeah, yeah. But there was there was nothing to match it. Mm. And the important and important thing is that it has dimensions added to it. Right. Because uh from a fairly similar area came Henry Glassie's books, the Passing the Time in Ballymanone yeah. and the Stars of Ballymanone That's and right. so on. Yeah. So there's, a, there's an, and also Marge Steiner's work mm. in Newton Butler, Newton Butler yeah. which is quite close to where They're all in the John Maguire would have come from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that th there's a whole picture, if you like, of what life was like and how the songs slotted into it and this I suppose is, is the importance of Robin that he began to he began to learn and he began to teach us the rest of us that the songs were nothing without the people Absolutely. and the people were nothing without the land and the people were nothing without their history yeah. and their feelings for it yes. and so it became something that context, instead yeah. of just looking at songs yeah. You had to look at everything else. You had to look at their lives. You had to look at their thoughts. And you had to realise that these were quite extraordinarily wonderful, intuitively and intellectually intelligent people with a vast knowledge of their own ground sort of like in social and of their own relationships really, yeah, yeah. and of the, the delicate relationships that they carried on with their neighbours. And, and I mean, it became something that, well, I mean, Pope's essay in man, the proper study of man, man of, of mankind is man. But it comes down to that. And that's where all these books come from. Yes. Because over there <coughs> is the, the history of Ireland, history of events in Ireland. 1798, the emigration mm. movements, mm -hmm. transportation to Australia, fairs and markets, and the local histories. Mm -hmm. Because you have to look minutely mm -hmm. at some of these songs in order to get the sense of them, to get the sense of where they came out of, and to get the sense of where they stand relative to not just Ireland's people, but Ireland's history. Mm -hmm. And then here there are Irish songs, American songs, because Irish songs went to America. And sometimes came back to us and so on so that it's all bound up mm -hmm. and okay you can love to sing songs that's enough because that's all that that's all that people nobody is expected to do any more than they want to do 
You can love songs and you can sing songs. You can love songs and you can love the people and the way they sing and you start looking at that. Nobody needs to go any further than they need do. Mm -hmm. I've just gone... A bit extra. <laughs> not, well, I, I wouldn't even call it an Shall extra because sometimes there have been such dead ends yeah. in what I have done. Yeah. But one of the reasons that I started looking at ballad sheets, for example, was because they explain not so much why people sing as what they sing. And it only occurred to me because that collection of ballad sheets that Mr. Kelly showed me in the Belfast Public Libraries, Music Library, back in the early 1960s, that book of broadsides, of ballad sheets, mm. there was a song called The Lisburn Lass. And when I encountered Geordie Hanna singing The Lisburn Lass, as I did when I met him for the first time, yes. And my, hair stood, and my hair song, stood yeah. on end. Mm. I went back to the ballad sheet to see what, what had Geordie been singing. Mm. And Geordie sang, She's proper tall and quite complete like a Wexford girl <laughs> from head to <laughs> feet. <laughs> my heart... It does pine when I when see, I her, see pass, her pass. For I'm deep, deep in, in love with the Lisburn Lass. Yeah. And the ballad sheet said she's proper tall and quite complete, like waxwork made <laughs> from head to feet. The words. And I immediately <laughs> realised yeah. that the origin of what Geordie sang yes. was held in the ballad sheet. And that between the, the ballad sheet and Geordie, there was a line of oral transmission. Somebody learned the song from the ballad sheet. And probably sang like waxwork made. Yeah. But somebody in the line of tradition, maybe it was Geordie himself, yeah. misheard or didn't know what a waxwork was. And that's not ignorance, because I'll, I'll explain that mm -hmm. argument in a moment or two. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the line of transmission made waxwork into Wexford mm -hmm. and made the, the verb made, M-A-D-E, into the noun made, M-A-I-D, mm -hmm. and got Wexford girl out of it. Yes. And so it is with minute bits of songs that you, you can almost trace the line in which they have developed. But I, 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 don't, like, I, I don't like the idea that we regard these alterations as being deteriorations or corruptions or mm. anything else. Versions, really? I think of them not even as versions because the word version implies that there's an original and this is a version and therefore to some extent inferior. Mm -hmm. What I think actually happens is that a song passes from one place to another mm. and the culture... <clears throat> the pool of knowledge in the first place is different mm -hmm. from the pool of knowledge in the second place. And so, in order for the thing to make sense in the second place, there have to be alterations. But it's not a deterioration of sense, it's a remaking of sense. So instead of version, you would use the word alteration? I would use, I would use the word variant. Variant? Just, it varies. Varies. They vary, and I don't care whether the variation is older mm -hmm. or younger. It simply expresses a different place or a different time. Mm -hmm. There's another. There's another wonderful example. You know the Maid of the Murloc Shore, Indeed. where where the linen webs. Well, in Ulster, that's well understood, mm -hmm. but in Clare, Monster, yeah. where there is much less linen weaving. Yeah. The singer, or a singer who was recorded singing that song, <coughs> sang Where the Linnet Wades. Now, he took the sound and he didn't know what the sense was. So he imposed a sense on it. Mm -hmm. He put sense to it. it. Where the linnet wades doesn't make, is not nonsense. And that's the important thing, that nearly every alteration in a series of traditional songs 
makes sense. It may make a new kind of sense, but it makes a sense which centers the song in the new location, the new area, to make it culturally acceptable within that area. Mm -hmm. And th this, is, this is just fascinating in the way that it reveals the workings of people's minds. Yeah. That no matter how primitive, no matter how backward, no matter how little educated we may assume people in a small country area might be, there is still a vast amount that they know that we will never be able to understand. Mm -hmm. There's a town land out here called Danaf where 150 place names have been collected Danaf. for 48 locations, mm -hmm. which means that the names are superimposed and that this implies generational change yeah. changes of usage yeah. changes of perfect perception mm -hmm. and all sorts of things in those 150 place names there's a whole mentality held in them mm -hmm. now this this may be this may seem to be a bit this is possibly a bit rarefied for 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 the ordinary for ordinary people but it's spotable mm -hmm. in the most ordinary yeah. of the, the most ordinarily worded song mm -hmm. that the song changes slightly yeah. and reveals a whole new yeah. set of thoughts just like to sort of digress for a moment i suppose into the singers and i know correct me if i'm wrong the first uh, sort of moving away the first proper uh, gathering of singers shall we call them in Ireland, uh, I believe, was at Fila Nabonia in Drogheda in County Louth. Is that, that correct, that, John? That would be so as far as a gathering a of... national gathering. A gathering of that. traditional singers yes. and young singers wanting to learn and, about And how songs. was that... How, that, <coughs> how, did, that, how did that... I suppose the question I want to ask you, um, you were obviously at that, I would assume. No, I wasn't actually. Oh, you that weren't? Was, right. that, was the, that, that I missed oh. because I was too bound up in a boarding school at that time. Right. Well, I suppose what I would ask is, you know, if you take that and take the the uh, Arts Council events that were organised by Belfast poet Kieran Carson and those gatherings of singers in Balik and Fermanagh and Port Rush and Down Patrick, how do you feel that those, you know, events and those festivals or those gatherings, how do you feel though that had an impact on singing, Ulster singing? You know, how did that help the situation you know, at that time, or encourage it even? Those were the first, or the first, if you like, conscious movements right. by young singers who had learned most of their songs in an urban environment. Right. That was the first time that singing was seen as something that needed to be promoted. Mm -hmm. Kieran Carson's idea, Sean Corcoran's idea, mm -hmm. previously in the Fena Nabonia mm -hmm. episode to which you referred. Mm -hmm. But I would like to take it back a wee bit because my first attempts <coughs> to encounter traditional singers were partly by inviting them like Cahal and like uh, Paddy Tunney and like Arthur Kearney, to be guests at our folk song club in Belfast yes. in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. But even before that, uh, Belfast's dominant traditional family would have been the McPeaks. Papers, yeah. Although the McPeaks didn't go to the Belfast cultus, to which went large numbers of very notable musicians. John Ray, the dulcimer player, Sean McAloon when he came back from England, Piper and Fiddler, right. Fergus McTaggart, uh, Alex and Doris Crawford, mm -hmm. uh, and, and various others uh, who met in Derry Volgi Avenue in, 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 
in a shed at the, at the back of somebody's house, as I remember. So that was the situation of the time. That was the that was the situation no of the time. Yes, events, but you know. there were singers. Yeah. There was Albert Fry, who's just mm. recently died. Yeah. Uh, and was David we Hammond went, involved in that? Dave, no, Davy no, Hammond no. was never involved no. in that. Okay. And even before that, there were attempts to start folk song clubs and folk music clubs and so on. But cultus seemed to me to involve the realist performers mm -hmm. and when there were songs sung they seemed to me with my limited experience at the time to be sung authentically and I became a sort of groupie of the McPeaks and followed them to the, glo the gory fla I think in 1962 right. where they were they had a Cayley band mm -hmm. which include, included Henry O'Prey as the piano player Henry's dead a long time now and Sean, Sean, uh, John Quinn, yeah, piano who accordion, piano accordion yes, piano player accordion. who lives in Knocknacarry and, and who, who's a, who was originally from Newcastle, but I went as a groupie with my then my then girlfriend, uh, and heard singing in the pubs, and the next year it was Mullingar. That was the that was the the the, the fla, after which Coltus resolved that they weren't going to have. All Ireland flies at Whit anymore, mm -hmm. or so close to Dublin, because, well, they, 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 they blamed us balladeers, as we were called, uh, for for the trouble that emerged at that time. <laughs> I was in a pub all evening with the Graham sisters and Luke Kelly and various others, and we never saw Causing any trouble riot, and trouble. we certainly <laughs> didn't make any <laughs> we didn't see any trouble at all yeah. but we went looking for songs yes. and looking for singers and i think that cultus and and various things brought together singers even before that time mm -hmm. And then there, w there was the John Player Ballad Contest, which was where I first met Geordie Hanna and his sister Sarah Ann. And how the, was that experience the, for you? Well, John? that that was meeting and hearing. That was him. just mind blowing. And entirely. What, what, what sense? I mean, this is a because an infamous story. I've because heard, we you know. we we learned songs. We learned songs out of books. Right. We learned songs out of uh, of records. And we sang them as somebody else's experience. Yeah. But when we heard Geordie and Sarah Ann, we heard people in whose lives and in whose understandings mm -hmm. these events, the events mentioned in the songs mm -hmm. and the form of experience was grounded in their lives or in the lives of people that they knew or pe people like them. And did you feel that this they was coming more, across in their they singing? Were much, it was authority. Right, okay. They had absolute authority over the songs that they sang. They had sung them so many times. Mm -hmm. They had thought about them yeah. so many times. Yeah. And and they weren't they weren't naturals. They mm -hmm. were people who had studied in their way mm -hmm. how to sing a song, how to tell a story, how how to how to feel a song through and 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 work at it mm -hmm. in their own way but uh, we recognized immediately something different and and we 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 wanted to pursue it and we wanted to we also wanted to emulate it we would have liked to be singers like those singers which is another reason for wanting to learn about songs about the background to songs to, to know about songs in if you like in the abstract but uh the whole business of <laughs> it was a crazy time uh gary hastings headed... gary hastings the flute player mm -hmm. talks about his youthful learning to play the flute it was like a red mist behind your eyes there was no real thought in your head except the next session 
the next time you could sing a song, the mm. next time you could Just talk to somebody. Fun. And it was, it was it was so intense. Was it like a drug nearly whenever you had that it it was. Yeah. And and so it went on. So that these these gatherings of singers that, yes. that you mentioned, starting with Fail and Abonia mm -hmm. and then going into the two sessions that were held successive years in Belique. Right. Belique. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. when when dozens of singers, young singers, Frank Hart, Jackie Deveni, Sean Corcoran, uh, Len Graham, and myself and others, met singers like Willie McElroy, yeah. Joe Holmes, yes. and others, and in those gatherings, mm -hmm. there was no difference made. And we learned, in fact, that the difference that we made between ourselves and the traditional singers was the source singers, was not a, a, not a real one. What you, not what a real no one at all. Well, how do you mean no difference? We were all made? singers. We just sang songs. But, but you were mixing the, with the likes of Willie McElroy and Joe. They were what we would regard as source singers. Yeah. And you guys were coming in, and you were all meshed together. And, and, it was and we sang songs that they had of, never know. heard before. And they would have. You know. And in, in a sense, we behaved like a ballad singer coming into a fair right. and singing a new song yes. in the old days. And somebody hearing the song and, and having an interest in it, and going and buying the paper mm -hmm. and taking it home and trying it over, or if he couldn't read, getting somebody else to read it and learning the words and finding an air for it or trying to approximate the air that the ballad singer had sang, sung uh, so that we were just new songs in, in the lives of these older singers and they were new songs in our lives and they were all the time teaching us and, and so on. We made differences but I think that at that stage it was inevitable that we would make differences but if I went to see those people now I would not make the same differences I wouldn't I wouldn't I would just see them as more other singers more singers they, they here are here are here are people who can be my friends and I can sing to and what sort of function did these weekends take was it was it everybody in the one room and an MC or Most, was, it, was it divided into different Different rooms was, and was, splinter it groups. Was, it or? was mostly. The program was loosely. Was it structured of, or unstructured? It was. It was structured to an extent. Uh, breakfast. There'd be the song at breakfast, or two, or three, or several. Right. And then, there might have been a, a lecture scheduled. Right. Uh, and. Nobody had to attend these lectures. And then there might have been a concert mm. later on. Yeah. And there would have been a, a, a round the house session. Yeah. And there would have been time for chat. Going out to the conservatory and at, at, the, at the hotel. And you see, we were residential. For From Friday evening... <laughs> to sun, late Sunday afternoon. There was plenty of time for talk, plenty of time for people to understand one another or to try to understand one another. Mm -hmm. And people were sharing rooms mm -hmm. and there were songs in one room or another. Mm. It's just when you, when you describe that now, but, I mean, since that yes, we've had so many festivals yes, and gatherings, but, at, but that, at that time it must have been completely it was, new. It was, you know, absolutely exciting to see. I mean, the the excitement I didn't recover from it for a week. I mean, is there any particular event or a sort of little anecdote from them weekends that is well, funny or there were to there me? were four of them. They were conceived by Kieran Carson and sold by him for funding to the Arts Council, as that music had plenty of outlets. Mm -hmm. because pub sessions could go on and people who were in the pubs wouldn't be interrupted. Yeah. And that singing was being pushed to one side 
by wall-to-wall music. So he thought that singing needed some kind of special support. So four times, once a year, in, in the autumn, as far as I remember, went to Balik twice, to Downpatrick, and then to Portrush. Portrush was the difficult one for me because I lived there and I wasn't residential, so I didn't, I didn't really get the crack. <laughs> but the thing was that they allowed singers from all over Ireland. Oh, it was because, all over Ireland, was it? Right. Yes, okay. because singers came up from Connemara, Josie, Sh- Josie Shan Jack and oh, Johnny right. Warch and Larry right. and, and, and others. Right. And from all over it Ulster. Ulster. It wasn't right. just oh, Ulster. Right. Okay. And, and the, the Dublin singers came up as well. Oh, you mentioned Frank. Yeah. Frank yeah. Too. So that it, it was absolutely... It it was riveting stuff. It was mind blowing, <laughs> and I have I have just digitized the tapes that I made of those weekends. Gee. Although I've got three cassettes that I have forgotten that I had, partly that Tom Munley had recorded some that that I have, but they are absolutely they they're wonderful. Yeah, they must have been mind blowing for that period of time. But at the end of that period, after after the fourth one. Uh, the Fork Hill traditional singing weekend had been started yeah. down down in Fork Hill Mullaban area Arma, yeah. in the Ring of Gullion, yeah. South Armagh, and uh, Kieran reckoned that his funding would be <clears throat> better used, directed mm-hmm. at the local area, as indeed it was, because out of that came people like John Campbell. And Michael Ned Quinn, right. and the and the other local singers from roundabout, people like uh, Brian Murphy, yes, who 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 came of a singing family. Patricia Flynn, etc. Yeah. Well, Patricia too, mm-hmm. uh, and they had not been to the the other weekends, mm-hmm. uh, so that it started something. Then, after a while, other. Others yeah, began the seed was to, planted. To, yeah. as, as I say, the, the seed was planted. It began to be accepted that there would be singing festivals. And then slowly but surely, uh, it, there grew up the idea of having groups of singers meeting mm-hmm. once, once a month, say, for a, a singer's circle. I mean, do, do you think, you know, if you just to another point for that period of time, we're talking here, what, the early 80s when this happened, was it? Uh, the early, the early 80s was the, the beginning of the Fork Hill. Now, you know, at, at that stage, even going back to the bleak things, I mean, was Ulster traditional singing or Ulster style? I mean, was it? I mean, I know a certain people or a certain man refer to it as the, the, the style that should be kept at the back room of public houses, you know, and... Uh, you know, I mean, at that time, across the country, nationally speaking, was Ulster regional style singing was it was it as important as we now know it is? We knew it was then, but was it had it got that status at that time? In in your opinion, well, this is where while I paid tribute to Coltus earlier, this is where one of the problems of Coltus began to raise its head, in that. Uh, you have competitions and thereby you have standards and by standards you have criteria and unfortunately the criteria which were adopted in terms of judging traditional singing were largely those of the middle and west yeah with the the, the tendency country. towards highly decorated uh very nasalized rather than the open rather more definitely syllabic and certainly rather less mellifluous and as i say less decorated style of the north which used glottal stops and variations in speed well, this is the ulster style in the ulster to. style okay. yes and these were not well understood or recognized Mm -hmm. Uh, 
But slowly but surely, sense reasserts itself mm-hmm. so that we can regard that as uh, regard that as an episode. It was an episode that, uh, in fact, started, if you like, a movement <laughs> towards a better and more equable representation of what traditional song style and indeed traditional music style Mm -hmm. would be considered to be. Mm -hmm. So that nothing, from my mind, no knowledge, no work is, is, or no occurrence is ever wasted, be it ever so distasteful. We can always take it and oppose it and use it to make a better model. I mean, do you think now, uh, you know, in the modern world we're living in, and certainly in the last year and a half or so, we've certainly entered a quite a modernisation with with uh, now singing gatherings on Zoom, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, do you think that you know regional style across Ulster, you know, in communities and localities, you know, is it is it still there? Is it as vibrant, or is it less vibrant in your opinion? Or what do you think about it, that? It it probably can't be as vibrant. But it must exist because, and this is where some of the problems with the Zoom sessions come in. I hear people sing and I know exactly which singer they got the song from. In other words, many of the singers who sing in these Zoom sessions are imitating, Mm -hmm. copying, or singing like another singer. The essence of the traditional styles is that you suit the song to your voice, even to altering the tune so that you can manage it. The song teaches you how to sing it to some extent. Mm -hmm. And I think that It's inevitable that singing styles will be less distinctive. At the same time, there are two of us here in this room who are speaking in definitely Ulster tones. Educated Ulster tones, yes, or citified or towny (laughs) rather than country Ulster tones. But still, when we sing, yeah. we are recognisably from Ulster. Yes. And it's, it's that first thing that I say that makes an immediate difference in singing style or should make an immediate difference across the country mm-hmm. that people must sing in their own natural voice and their own natural accent. Now, I, I don't do it always, but that, that's a council of perfection because... <clears throat> Uh, I've learned songs from all sorts of places and Mm -hmm. I haven't overcome my sources yet Mm -hmm. in some cases. But the thing is that it's inevitable Mm -hmm. that there will be individual and localised styles. Mm. We're likely to recognise the individual much more quickly than we recognise or place it in a regional context. Do you think there's individual styles within regions then, obviously? I think that there are individual styles. Every singer has an individual style. Mm -hmm. But every singer also, if he sings with his own voice, has a regional accent and perhaps a local accent more or less strong and should use it and just sing and use the the natural words that naturally one would use Mm -hmm. and and so on but I suppose for students I don't think it should be studied right I think you should study and then leave it alone okay I think that the study is all to do with getting it getting it into your own head so that the story and the song and the tune and the feeling and the place is as natural as breathing. Mm-hmm. That's the way Geordie sang. It's the way Eddie sang. If you, th- if you take younger singers now, you know, students of Irish folk song or Irish song research, you know, when you started to explore this field, you had a few people who've mentioned and 
then of course the likes of these source singers we talked about the likes of John mm-hmm. McGuire, Jordy Hanna, Sarah Ann O'Neill but nowadays for any student of Irish song you know have we got source singers still where do they go to start for the people who are viewing this today <coughs> or viewing this whenever they are viewing it where would they go now to suss out as we would call them a source singer or is that well, possible well, the thing is, I'm a source singer. If I sing you a song and you learn it, I'm your source. Your, yeah. So, yeah. again, th- this is another term yeah. that I think has pretty well no meaning. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, it's a false distinction. Yeah. I could go to living, mm-hmm. living close at hand and, and actually owning a house at the end of this row. Yes. Is Michael James Michael James on, mm-hmm. who lives in Cluncha, mm-hmm. and who's one of the finest singers of his generation. Mm-hmm. In in this whole area, and his way of singing is entirely family based, local based, regional based, and county based, and province based. So he hasn't really it's, it's Ulster. been influenced it's done by outside. Yes. He's been influenced by any number of things. Yeah. But he chooses to sing in his own voice. Yeah. He chooses to sing in his own voice because for him, coming from his family, singing is a natural thing. Mm-hmm. His father used to insist that everybody who came into the, into the house sang. Before they were before they were half an hour in the house, he was saying, "Have you a song?" <laughs> and every event that there was, the the ram sales, and bringing home a ram that the family would gather, and after a while he would start by insisting, and probably singing, the Harry Lauder song. It's a fine thing to sing, <laughs> and and Michael, and and his and his brother Charlie now dead and his other brother Pat sing just because they, like they know they're allowed to mm-hmm. their family gave them permission now one of the problems in our time is that people don't have permission to sing not unless you have a good voice or unless you're well known or have made a CD our society doesn't give people permission to sing but this community and every other community in Ireland allowed people to sing, allowed them to sing in their own voices, allowed them to sing what they wanted to sing and welcomed it, whether they sang with a good voice, a poor voice. The singing was the value. Mm -hmm. The essential aesthetic was the matter of performance Mm -hmm. and this this is so in every traditional society that has ever been looked at Mm -hmm. now for us if we're seeking in our own lives simply to live in a way that allows music and art to flourish in our lives we just should sing so where do you go for your songs the youngsters learning to sing go to anyone who has a song or anywhere that has a song the radio a cd Mm -hmm. an lp Mm -hmm. a book anything and if you're looking for songs there are so many ways in which you can find them take a song title and put the words of the song title or the, the words of its first line in a google search And you will find the words and quite possibly a performance of large numbers of them. Any one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that people find their own level. People find what they like. Most people won't like traditional songs. They're not readily understandable. They don't repeat themselves. There are too many words in them for a lot of people. 
They have difficult tunes. I sang to, to teachers on occasions who came up afterwards about the most commonplace traditional song, tr traditional tune, and said, those are very difficult tunes. But they're not difficult tunes. It's only lack of usage. The trouble with things these days is not that we sing the wrong songs, not that we sing and can't find songs or we find the wrong songs or whatever. It's that people don't sing at all. That's the real danger, the real problem. I would welcome anybody singing anything mm -hmm. into, my, into my company. If they're singing anything, then they are receptive to singing. They're going to listen better to somebody else's singing. There might be something <coughs> happens during the evening that attracts them. Can I have that? Would that be your, for the purpose of this conversation today, would that be your conclusion to your life's work and interest? Oh yes, absolutely. It's as simple as this. You know, is this sing. Sing. Sing what you like to sing. And the other thing which some people actually quite object to is if you don't like it the way you heard it, change it. <laughs> or if you don't understand it, yes. change it. And if there's a bit in it which doesn't make sense to you, yes. change it until it does make sense. Yes. Because to my mind, for, for somebody to sing nonsense... Mm -hmm just because it was sanctioned by this old singer or that old singer. Yes. Well, that particular old singer either didn't understand what he heard or else the person who transcribed it didn't understand it. It's up to me to put sense on it. This is a human activity. This is people. This is people working together. This is mm. people having fun together. Mm -hmm. This is people having a relationship. It's a social gathering. Do you, do, do you ever have fun and understanding and belief in people better than you have in the, gatherers, in the gatherings of singers yeah. that you find? You find love mm -hmm. and friendship and exchanges. And just my conclusion also really very simple sing sing what you like change it if you don't like it allow other people the same freedom that you have in other words they can make changes too mm -hmm. and you don't object because they will comfortably die if they're no use just let them die but there's one other factor and that is that you always give songs away. If anybody asks you for a song, however they want it, if they want it from a book, from a recording, from your dictation, from wherever, give it to them. Because in song tradition, where people sing, somebody else sings it. They take it from you and they sing it themselves. Now, they might mess it up, but whatever it is, I've still got it, the way I thought of it, the way I love it. But sometimes, and actually quite often, somebody to whom you gave a song comes back to you and they sing it in a way that you never would have thought of, that brings out the beauty of the words or the tune. Mm -hmm. Or the circumstances and they make it even more real for you than it ever was before you get back more than you gave so that those those principles sing sing what you like change it allow other people the freedom and give your songs away never ask anybody to never send anybody away empty-handed if they ask for something and John where for the purpose of students or scholars or whatever of, of songs, where, you know, can they avail of your work if they wish to? 
Well, my work is most easily accessible, the work which has been published and some which hasn't, on my website, which is simply Molden, spelling my name M-O-U-L-D-E-N dot org. And that gets to a web page called John Molden on Irish Songs. Mm -hmm. And I'm my writings are there. Okay. But they're they're not much they're not much cop for for people unless they're passionate about songs. Look for the songs first. And the places to look for songs are anywhere there are singers, but also go to the website of the Irish Traditional Music Archive, mm -hmm. which I'll spell that, I-T-M-A dot I-E, and look about it. There are songs recorded there, or even just Google. Any song you want might be on Google recorded but traditional singers old singers young singers this song this whatever they're there mm -hmm. they're there for the taking and anybody who wants to sing is is in the absolute lap of luxury these days in comparison with how it was when i first wanted to sing it's easy street entirely just the songs are there. The only trouble is there are far too few people singing at all. To finish this afternoon, um, John, I would um, like to thank you for uh, an absolutely wonderful insight to your interest in life in, in songs. And I'd like to ask you to maybe give us a song to finish the proceedings. Well, thank you, Carl. I, I will. But before that, I'll give you some idea of how I came across the song. It was, of course, in a library. Uh, Linen Hall Library again. Going through old books that had the word songs in them. And I came across this one called Poems and Songs on Various Subjects by Hugh McWilliams, Schoolmaster published in 1831 in Belfast and the poems didn't look that promising but as I went through the book and got to the songs 32 songs at the back and the first of them was Glenavy Deer a song which I knew had been sung by Robert Cinnamond from himself Glenavy and then as I looked through these 32 songs, I recognised four or five more, which I knew were traditional songs. When a man's in love, the trip we took over the mountain, uh, and a maid of 17. And I was astonished. Thought that perhaps he'd taken them out of tradition and represented them as his own work. But as I looked at them, I realised here was the man who wrote folk songs, or a man who wrote folk songs, which is, of course, a complete denial of the concept of folk songs. Here was an educated schoolteacher writing songs, published them in a book, and people sang them. So that it confirmed me in some of the ideas that I had. But among the songs was one called Peace in Erin. And it was directed to be sung to a tune because nearly all of these 32 songs had a tune named to which they might be sung. And the tune which he named was called Rattling Guns. Now Rattling Guns reminded me of when autumn winds and slaughtering guns bring autumn's winter weather. Mm -hmm. The Ode to Autumn by Robert Burns. And it turned out that at the time when he was publishing these books, Hugh McWilliams lived in the townland of Irish Omerban, which is near 
Newton Crumlin in the Antrim Plateau. And Len Graham had collected a version of Westland Winds, the song which probably Hugh McWilliams named as Rattling Guns, in the next townland, scary townland, from a guy called Tommy Kelly. And when I tried the air to which Tommy Kelly had sung the Ode to Autumn, it absolutely fitted. So the, the set of words and the tune came out of the one, well, the two adjoining townlands. Now, I put the song together, but I put it together from, if you like, the most plausible roots. That is, the words from Irish Omer Man, the tune, admittedly, 170 years later from Scary, but the fact that they fitted makes me think that they belong. So here's the song, and it's particularly important to me because my life and that of my whole generation was disrupted from 1969 until the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. And this is my favourite song. Well, there's one other, but I'm not sure. My favourite song because it asserts my politics and the politics which I think should be pursued by absolutely everybody in Ireland and which, unfortunately, I regret are not always followed. If all the world inclined would be to live in love and unity, no more contention there would be upon the land of Erin. Originally we are sprung from Father Adam, old and young. These words should flow from every tongue. <coughs> we'll cherish peace in Erin. We're formed by one deity to worship him. Let's all agree and live in love and unity with everyone in Erin. On Sunday, if our roads do lie to Clough or to the glens hard by, how would it weaken friendship's tie among the sons of Erin? What shore can boast so pure an air, or girls more, or sons more brave, or girls more fair, or who was more esteemed in war before the boys of Erin? Their valour far abroad is known, in the field of Mars their glory shone, then let us cultivate at home the arts of peace in Erin. Would freedom fair and commerce smile upon my dear, my native isle? Not Egypt with her flowing Nile should equal thee, sweet Erin. Fine silver lakes and purling springs and verdant groves where music rings and health with healing in her wings, do bless the land of Erin. Tis principle that proves to man this is the one, the only plan, and one that I have built upon as passing through old Erin. Then let us at the present day drive prejudice and spleen away far, far beyond the Atlantic Sea, and we'll all join hands in Erin. Thank you, John.